Hello, everyone, and again, uh, uh, a very warm welcome to another in our series of uh, interview with the experts. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Bell. I'm the vice chair for the uh, Department of uh, Cardiovascular Diseases uh, here in, in Rochester. And joining me today is uh, Dr. Chris uh, DeSimon, who's an uh, associate professor of medicine and a consultant in our Heart Rhythm Services uh, Division. So, Chris, thank you for being with us uh, today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so we're here to talk about the rate versus rhythm control in 2023 uh, in atrial fibrillation. And I think it's probably an understatement that atrial fibrillation is just, uh, really an increasing or places an increasing burden of uh, uh, on cardiovascular disease uh, currently. And today, what I'd really like to start with uh, focusing on is how do you approach the patient uh, with uh, nuanced atrial fibrillation in terms of rate versus rhythm control? Now, I know you really want to talk about ablation, but let's just uh, stay with medical therapy to start with, and then we'll uh, come to ablation in a moment. Excellent. You've, you've hit the nail on the head. It is really exploding the atrial fibrillation. We're seeing more and more patients with it, new onset, previously treated or controlled atrial fibrillation, and now it's gotten out of control. So it's really been a big burden on our healthcare um, landscape. But the good news is it's a really exciting time to be in electrophysiology, especially for those of us that really love to treat patients with atrial fibrillation. The big news that's been coming out in the last couple uh, events and the last couple of the meetings has been this rate versus rhythm controlling approach and a shift, if you will, in the paradigm. You know, when a firm came out maybe almost 20 years ago now, there's really no difference if you have atrial fibrillation and in terms of outcomes, if you had them in a rate controlling approach versus a, versus a rhythm controlling approach. But now if we fast forward the last 10 years, especially, we've gotten much better in our equipment and our uh, drug armamentarium and really stiffering out the patients that will benefit in addition to risk factor modifications from being in normal sinus rhythm akin to them being in uh, atrial fibrillation, especially when they have atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular heart rates or atrial fibrillation with heart rates that have caused them to go into heart failure. So there's an explosion in the field on this and how to manage patients. And really the paradigm shifted. No, I do remember when a firm came out, as you said, about 20 years ago. I mean, there was a collective sigh, at least among uh, the non-electrophysiologists um, like me, that, oh, things are going to be simple. We don't need to put this patient in the hospital for all these drug trials. Um, is it fair or unfair to say that, uh, I mean, the short the follow-up that was relatively uh, short, but is it fair or unfair to say that that's outdated and irrelevant uh, today? I would say follow-up was short, like you're saying, that's a good critique. And the kind of outdated bit, I really would strongly um, be in line with that. Our medicines have gotten better, not only in terms of rhythm controlling agents, but also our anticoagulation. So before all those patients would have been on most likely Coumadin, but now we have the novel oral anticoagulants, uh, many of them, and those are helping reduce the stroke risk. And that was a big part of that uh, arm in that study. So the medicines have gotten better and our detection methods have certainly gotten better with the Apple watches and all kinds of holters and what you will, where patients can monitor these things at home and pick these things up earlier. I mean, obviously, stroke prevention is so important in, in these patients, regardless of how we're treating them in, in general. So are, are you saying now that there's a shift towards more rhythm control? So someone you know, who's had new onset atrial fibrillation, maybe cardioversion with antiarrhythmic therapy, um, and of course, anticoagulation, and mm -hmm. then weight control if they do go into atrial fibrillation, so let's turn to ablation then. I mean, where does ablation fit in in 2023? So great, great points you bring up. I think it's an individualized strategy. So it's hard to generalize for every person that comes in, but it's kind of that atrial fibrillation patient or more likely I like to think about it as atrial fibrillation syndrome. What type or where they are in this atrial fibrillation syndrome and spectrum. So when they're coming in to see you with atrial fibrillation, 
Have they been in atrial fibrillation for a couple of years and just have been asymptomatic? Has atrial fibrillation been picked up when they were at a colonoscopy? Or did they come in the emergency department or to the CCU and heart failure because they had atrial fibrillation, which caused them to go into a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy? So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, but in terms of who we feel is best for ablation, or I would actually even step back further and say, who's most appropriate for a rate controlling approach versus a rhythm controlling approach, rhythm controlling approach being a rhythm, being an antiarrhythmic agent, such as the class one agents, flecainide or propafenone, or the class threes, such as sotol or ticosin, sometimes even with amiodarone for short periods of time versus and, or as an adjunct to catheter ablation. Now, I think everyone deserves a chance at normal sinus rhythm because it's really tough to tease out to these patients. Are they really symptomatic or have they just become used to their atrial fibrillation? And that's not only therapeutic to cardiovert, but that's also diagnostic. If I try to diagnose someone and get them out of atrial fibrillation with a cardioversion, if it's relatively simple, then that atrial fibrillation has probably not been longstanding or it hasn't progressed. You know, it's really that paroxysmal. They're coming in and out of atrial fibrillation. Other patients, they're hard to get out. Maybe they're in persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation. And those are the patients I'll trial a drug, load them up on it, and then try a cardioversion again. If, if I'm hearing you correctly here, you're really saying that we should really try to achieve sinus rhythm if we possibly can. And that may be initially with cardioversion and drug therapy. Mm -hmm. But if we think about the alternative of rate control, is there a downside to that? So that's what have we been practicing for so many uh, years mm -hmm. now. But is there a downside that, uh, for example, they seem to be well controlled, but maybe in two years' time or five years' time, they're doing okay, but at that point, they are having problems. Mm -hmm. Is there something about those patients at that point that they're not going to be so easy to treat with ablation? Def definitely. So the downsides to that are usually we try to say, well, let's stay below 100 average over 24 hours on a Holter monitor. And sometimes it takes a lot to get those patients in that rate controlling range. So the downside would be you're putting them on beta blockers, you're putting them on calcium channel blockers. And especially if these are younger or active patients, they really feel the side effects of those medicines. They kind of feel slowed down overall. I would say that's one downside. The second downside is the longer you're in atrial fibrillation, you know, atrial fibrillation begets more atrial fibrillation. So when you have the paroxysm atrial fibrillation, that type of, if you will, AFib syndrome is far different than the patient that's moved all the way over into a persistent. So they've been in it for years or several months and they can't get out of it. It's a different thing. It's sort of like the, the, the horse getting right out of the barn. Early on, when you're trying to treat atrial fibrillation and we call it paroxysmal, it's more of a trigger-based approach. All of the atrial fibrillation triggers is what we go after. And these are coming from the pulmonary vein musculature themselves. But as you progress to persistent atrial fibrillation, then you get a trigger and substrate based issue. So you're having a remodeling of the atrium. They get larger, they get more scarred, they get more thicker. Lots of things that are uh, going into where it was much easier to treat that person if you if you dealt with them early on compared to keep them on a recontrol for three, four, five years, and then down the road, you can't get them out of atrial fibrillation, or it's really tough to get them out of atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Now you intimated there that uh, ablation techniques that, you know, have improved um, and, you know, the tools that you're using, you know, for, for the ablation. Could you just very quickly uh, just tell us, you know, what is an optimal uh, atrial fibrillation abl ablation procedure? Yes. And also, what is its success and what are the risks? Yes, that's a great question. So anything we want to do in interventional cardiology or anything in medicine, everything's going to come with it risks, and then there's going to be its own benefits to that. Now, we do not cure atrial fibrillation ablation. We can't cure it yet. We're just not that smart enough, and the catheter technology is not smart there to say, how can we make good ablation lesions? How can we keep these lesions settled? And we don't know how well the patient's going to make these lesions settle after they're scarring over. So it's never a cure. We always make patients aware of that. The other thing it's not a cure or elimination for is if we do an ablation that does not alleviate or obviate your stroke risk, the stroke risk is still there. The cornerstone of therapy is still anticoagulation. Now, 
Nowadays, when we do catheter ablation, everyone gets the standard pulmonary vein isolation procedure. So there's usually two or three or maybe two and one uh, pulmonary veins on each side of the left atrium. And these are draining oxygenated blood from the lungs into the heart. And when we are born, this muscle sleeve grows out from the left atrium and it gets caught up inside those pulmonary veins. Those are like the matchsticks. Those are what lights the atrium on fire. When those get out, that's what sets the left atrium into atrial fibrillation. So our standard approach, standard goal, and some people do this cryoablation where they freeze tissue or with radio frequency ablation where they heat tissue is to do a pulmonary vein, what we call a WACA, a wide area circumferential ablation around the outside within the heart of the veins. And what we're trying to do is let blood flow between the lungs and the heart, but not electricity from those veins because those are the triggers. So what would be, for example, uh, let's use an endpoint, uh, what percentage of people would be free of atrial fibrillation, Mm -hmm. let's say five years time after successful ablation initially? Yep. So this is also a matter of debate in, in, in our society and all these shows is what's the best endpoint? Is it time to 30 seconds or more of atrial fibrillation or burden of atrial fibrillation? All the studies so far, and many studies have done this in the past, that it's time to first episode of ablation. And with time to first episode of ablation, if someone's paroxysmal, it's about 65 to about 80% being free of atrial fibrillation at one year's time. And then, of course, at five years time, this dramatically goes down. So clearly not a cure, but an improvement in symptoms. And this may require additional ablations or an adjunctive medical therapy on top of that. And the risk? Uh, The risks. So usually we're quoting around the range of one to three percent of risks. Now, the major ones we're worried about are access site, groin hematomas or bleeding. We're also going up into the heart and going outside of the pulmonary veins, but there's a risk that you could narrow or stenose the pulmonary veins themselves. I would say there's a small risk, and this is a lethal risk, of something called an atroesophageal fistula. So the esophagus is right behind the atrium where we're burning. We got to keep a very close eye and minimize our time and heating of that area because there could be a communication which could be life-threatening. I would say other risks, very small, would be damage of coronary arteries near that area, um, conduction system tissue requiring a pacemaker or sometimes damage to the valves. But these are much lower risks. I would quote overall one to 3% risk of this. And obviously there's going to be a discussion about, you know, the benefits, trade-off or risk uh, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, versus the the, the medical therapy and and particularly those who you may be just focused on, you know, on rate control. So uh, it seems though there's been a paradigm shift here, and I'm going to give you the last word here, Chris. So maybe sure. very, very quickly, because we're running out of time here, mm-hmm. uh, just summarize your approach to the patient with new onset atrial fibrillation that uh, is going to need uh, treatment. Yes. So my approach... New onset atrial fibrillation, I think those patients deserve a cardioversion and a chance to get back into sinus rhythm. If they feel better, then I would offer them and I let the patient dictate, do they want to try an antiarrhythmic drug or do they want to try a catheter ablation? And sometimes they want to choose both and sometimes they want to choose the drug and then do the ablation if they break through. And that's completely that's a completely good argument and, and way to go. Second thing, if someone's in heart failure, so if the atrial fibrillation is causing what we think is a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, then I strongly urge that patient to maintain a rhythm controlling approach. Usually we'll put that patient on amiodarone for a couple months, let the heart shrink down and heal, and then perform a catheter ablation approach. It's really the, the, the tipping point would be if the patient has heart failure or not. If the patient has no symptoms and the patient does not feel better after that cardioversion, I do not pursue rhythm control right off the bat. It's really more so of, am I getting the bang for my buck, improving the patient's symptoms, or am I improving their quality of life and overall mortality benefit if I could get them out of heart failure? And of course, the background of uh, anticoagulation, and you already hundred percent safer now uh, that we've got uh, better uh, agents. Well, I think there's a tremendous number of people going to take a lot from uh, this uh, um, discussion here, Chris. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much.